This is Iris Lodowitz, founder and CEO of Japerency. I'll be discussing how LPs can get a handle of their investments in the past and better protect themselves for the future. In this episode of Mind Your Business, I sit down with Iris Lodowitz, founder and CEO of Gparency. And I ask him a lot of straight questions. Is now the right time to get involved in real estate? What are uh, you know some tips and tricks that someone should be mindful of when they get into the world of real estate as it relates to today? Without further ado, Ira Zlotowicz. Ira, the founder and CEO of Gparency, thank you so much for carving out of your crazy, hectic schedule and joining me here on the set, Mind Your Business. Welcome back. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's uh, great to be back. And I um, like the new studio. Last time we in a different studio. That's right. Upgrade here. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Glad to be here. Let's talk about Gparency. It's a dynamic brokerage marketplace that streamlines the commercial real estate experience. A membership-based commercial mortgage brokerage, they specialize in assisting players in finding, financing, underwriting, and tracking their deals within minutes. Ira, the last time you were here, I don't want to say you were in a different career, you are in the real estate space, but you founded and were running a major company. I don't want to say you you threw it all away, but you I don't know what, what got into you. You decided to take some type of crazy risk and jump into G Parency. First, can you tell us about your backstory and then like, like what happened to you? You took some big gamble here. Thank you very much. So I would like to believe as my former partner, I'm still a partner, but uh, I lived day to day with him um, in the business, he used to say that there were two train companies. One's tagline was something best in transportation and one was best in train uh, transportation. Okay. One best in train transportation doesn't exist. How do you get around today? Cars and planes and whatnot. The other one still exists. They adapted. I always call myself a trusted advisor. So, you know, it's time to he- stay ahead of the curve. I went into the brokerage business, the mortgage brokerage business, as a trusted advisor. And then as the market evolved and I f- saw, you know, the technology was also changing, I felt that to be able to stay that trusted advisor and provi- be able to provide that same value as the market's going to change just to evolve to a different business model. So I use it similar to what they call Netflix versus right. Blockbuster. That's right. So I used to read these books. I said, I'll never want to be Netflix out of my own business. And I said to myself that I saw the handwriting on the wall then. Then, two years ago, people said, crazy, the market's going amazing. Right. Why would we make a change? Why make a risk? And today, where it's most it's most self-evident. We just rolled out a few, uh, our, our, our marketplace, the technologies. People say, wow, there's a big difference in the world, providing a value. Then, who who thought about technology when it came to commercial real estate. It was all about, you know, the human interaction only, the broker. So on one hand, yes, you can't time a market. Maybe I could have waited six more months and get six more months out of the old market before I went. But thank God I saw that, you know, we were fortunate to be doing $5 billion a year in transactions. We're number three in America and the number of transactions a year. But I felt when the next market corrected itself, that business was going to change totally. Just like travel agents change, stockbrokers change. It's going to change drastically. Now people are starting to see it now as we speak. So it's not that, it's like, you know, take that risk. I don't want to be Netflix out of my business. You got to become that Netflix and take that risk at that time. So glad I did. Tough two years, but thank God we took that risk. Now, G-Parency was officially founded in 21? Yeah, on November of 21. Okay, so it's less than two years old as of, as of this interview, which is coming, which is taking place in August of 23. In 22, you were named one of the top 50 startups by LinkedIn. Okay, H- how did that, I mean, that's like, in fact, so, that liftoff is like just, wow. Right, so I appreciate that. So actually what's interesting is that normally as being into marketing, so you try to find, you you, you, you apply to certain things. This was like out of left field. We didn't even apply to it. Someone, and you know, we reached out to LinkedIn and they said like, how did you like, no one applied. <laughs> they actually said, that's the power of LinkedIn numbers. They know where like, they know where things are at. They're not asking. It's not you know a lot of surveys. They get an opinion. Right. You say you're great. They interview. They check people out. But you can't you can't fudge by the numbers. You know that's. Uh, Can we uh, ask when you had Cranes forty under forty? How did that come about? So Cranes forty under forty that came about. I met a a a news reporter once, and you know, Cranes like and then like I got a phone call back like six months later that I was nominated. But it came again because that news reporter remembered when they met me, they went through. So, you know what I mean? Like that was the... But here with LinkedIn, it's, it was driven by the numbers. It was driven by the numbers. It was, uh, thank God. Now, 
let's talk about that again when you started in 21 it was a is it fair to say a crazy risk okay to you it was more calculated because you understood so, but it was, you know when people invest in real estate and there's two terminologies that get used one is called cash and cash i put in a dollar how much cash am i getting back mm -hmm. the other thing is called irr it's really complicated basically over the life of the investment i don't care if i get zero year one and zero year two but I make up enough in three, four, five, six, and when I sell it to make up for that lost time, to me, the cash and cash was a terrible idea. I was going to the world, educating them that they could get the same services potentially just by paying a subscription to me. Or they could pay me a measly $4,500 to place a deal when brokers are charging sometimes 100000 or half a million dollar fees. So I was going to a place where if it wasn't successful, I bet the house. Yeah. So I'm educating people to that the old way is going to change and how people are going to go. So yeah, so at that time... But I was pretty confident in the IRR. I was pretty confident that when the market was going to change or settle in, it'll make up for that lost time. Because the other business has also its flaws. As Now it's becoming clear in, in the current market today with the amount of uh, how, how, how business is taking place. Ira, I just want to still hold on for a minute here. You were running a successful business. And then 21, you decided, okay, I, I have the vision for something. But there's risk involved. And you're Fair to say, you, it was a comfortable position that you were at beforehand. What were some of the risks involved? Maybe you could discuss that from that angle. So there were a lot of risks. Um, it was nerve-wracking. Um, I'd like to believe it was calculated at that time. Okay. You know, what made it more comforting is that it was the largest seed round from venture capital. So there was money in the bank and a, and a belief there's over 100 real estate professionals, 150 real estate professionals invested um, in the company. But still the risk. The biggest risk was what was going to be the reaction of the players at that time, number one, and with clients' skepticism ready for a change. So on the first part, what was interesting is that, you know, I was thinking to myself in my mind, what would I do if a competitor did this? Would I match them, not match them? Think about the blockbuster story. So... I took it, I, I, you know, it's in the beginning I said, if they match me, that was the only trouble I could have. But they're not going to match me because they're not going to give the business overnight. I at least have a plan to go into. So that didn't happen. But I thought that maybe they were going to get together, a few of them, and call it the banks and say, if you take deals from GParency, we're never doing business with you again. And then hold them like you see in industries. What I realized when I opened up, that was a big fear. It was my biggest fear that when I opened up, they didn't take that approach. Not because they're nice. They didn't take the approach because number one, that they they so believe that like they're never gonna have competition. Like this little thing is gonna compete against this idea is never gonna compete against them. So it worked in my favor. They knocked that day. You always need a broker. You need a person. You need this. Even though I, I agree, you need a broker and a person. But they were taking quotes mm -hmm, out of mm -hmm. context. But no problem. That was one. It was a help. Number two, the commercial real estate business, and that's why I've been trying to tackle it, is so fragmented. If you look at every other industry in the world. Look at, look at the iPhone. What percent does the iPhone have a market share? What, what percent does a, a certain car company have? A certain, there's huge market shares. The number one brokerage firm in the country had less than a 10% market share. Mm. So there's no like, and there's so many lenders, and everyone has a different, so when I realized that, that's, that's the beauty of the business. I'm, I'm in a business, I'm in a space now where I have the whole market open to me. So that's, that was my fear. Once I got past a few months in, then no one anticipated how quickly the market was gonna slow. Right. But I had I have a marketplace. I have a technology. So that technology applies to everyone involved in real estate at that time. Amazing. I want to ask how many of the other companies actually <laughs> leverage your own technology. No, I'm not. not um, yeah. So I do know that there are there there are several competitors that I know of. Even tell me openly. By the way, your bank list. How do you think I get the bank list? I get the benefit. I pay a subscription. And I have it. Then it comes in under that uh, guide. So, <laughs> you know. You know, I like to tell people, if your broker is using my bank list, right? Yeah. So it means we have a great bank list. <laughs> and their counter is, yeah, but you don't know how to use it. Oh, I'm the broker, I know how. So that was like the banter that goes back and forth. Now, let's talk about the, really the, um, the foundation of GParency. What every business exists to solve a pain point in the marketplace. Maybe you can get straight to what was the pain point that GParency solved? So we used, we used to use the terminology equitable access. Um, if someone came over to you and said, I want to go and get involved in commercial real estate, where do I go? Right. No one has an answer. I didn't have an answer. Someone said, oh, uh, start by finding if you get money. Uh, start by someone who's brokering. Call this, go on to this website. I, 
and every step there's like someone else. Like you know, you're in a mall and you have to go like to the to the to the to guy to say where's right. the store? How do you go right. there? And there's no, there's, it's not, it's not out there. There's no solution. So I wanted to build a front door for commercial real estate. Come to Japan, Z. Equitable access. I don't care if you have money, you don't have money. Use my tools. And depending to what level you want to engage the tools and use the tools, even if you've really fallen in love, you want to use everything. The top tier membership is only five hundred dollars a month or five thousand a year for your whole company. So anyone will tell you in commercial real estate, there's nothing that you do that's less than five thousand dollars a year. Right. Like it's not. Right. And that was the goal. So we started from zero. There's a freemium model. Zero. Okay. Then there's a hundred limited access and unlimited five hundred. So I want to be the front door. And that's why when we were saying it before in the intro, we are a brokerage marketplace, which we provide all the tools for a commercial real estate player at any level to find, finance, underwrite, track all the deals, overlaid on a map. And our signature product is if you want a broker to place your deal, we could do that to 4500 Or for $100, I'll tell you the five banks to go to. So that's how it all wraps together in the system we have. And obviously, we have data. We have 100,000 listings, and we have comps on 35 million properties. We have a lot of stuff there, but th those little pieces exist in different places. And maybe some of those pieces, people say, oh, there's better data for this here, but, but holistically, come here as a starting point or a place to keep your notes and your documents and organize and alerts. That holistic front door marketplace doesn't exist. So, you know, as you know, you know, working with my dad when I went into business, my dad told me, he says, let me tell you two things. Build a product that you don't know a way how to make it better and charge the cheapest you could charge so you don't leave room for com competition to get in. So of late, when people start seeing the calculator we rolled out a couple of weeks, uh, beginning of July, right. they said, wow, I spent $2 million on a calculator that any that any novice could also know what they're doing and could underwrite a deal, IRR, cash and cash, splits and share, and talk like they know what questions to ask just from it. They did a real estate course that uses the calculator as an overlay. And when people look at this, they say, like, how much is this? Oh, free, you're not charging us to play with it? You could, you mean saying, if I only have less than 25 deals, I never pay you? No problem. So they say, and even the top does five towns to too cheap. What's the catch? There's no catch. Because you know what the answer is? There's 10 million commercial real estate players. You're either a GP, you buy real estate, you're an LP, or you're a service provider that markets the GPs. So I allow you, even if you're a service provider, the building we're in, if there was a, a, a title company, or there was a general contractor, could go to this property and say, I was the service provider. When someone's on the map in the area looking at a building across the street, they say, oh, there's someone connected across the street. Call the person up. It's a human side of the business. Say, hey, what's going on? So I have a product that's accessible for 10 million people in commercial real estate at any level. And there's a certain percent that will use all the services. And $100 a month and right. 125 move up to the highest right. of 500 Mind your business with the Essex Aftis right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, and around the world on the powerful iHeartRadio network. My guest, Ira Zlotowicz the founder and CEO of Gparency, and he actually is, you know, <laughs> he's, I mean, and anyone that knows Iris Lotowitz knows that he's very frank, very upfront, and very transparent, and it's no different tonight. He's sharing a lot of secrets. I'm surprised by how much he's sharing, but I, what can I say? Thank you. Thank you for being so Thank open you. and frank and honest and transparent so that people could see. Hence the name, Transpa Gparency. Gparency. GP that, Transparency. That's, that's, that's what it is. Wow. Um, let's, you know, I, I'm going to go to a question that's probably on many people's minds because, again, for all the people out there that are in and have been in real estate for many years, it's the, they know the answers to these type of questions. But let's say there's someone out there that um, has an extra 10, 25,000, whatever it is. Is there a certain threshold that a person who is, we're going to talk about LPs soon. Someone this that, is LPs. It says the LPs, correct. So this is really at, at the core of, of, of being an LP, a limited partner. They, they, they have a separate business. They're in B2C. They have an eyeglass store. But they have some extra cash to invest. And they're saying, you know, okay, interest rates. Okay, now it's actually, let's say, pretty good. But, but still, there's like they, they've heard real estate. Shlish Bakarka. There's, there's there, real estate. I should put money in real estate. What is like a certain, is there a minimum threshold to be thinking to jump into real estate investing? So I'm going to answer this question. Like I was saying before, we want to be the front door. So let me start to the other extreme. Okay. We have like, we call it two personas. There's GP Gary. Okay. Who is the big real estate tycoon who you think of. Could Or acquisition analyst. I'm just starting. Okay. So <laughs> the acquisition analyst could be one of two people. Okay. It could be someone that's looking to invest with a GP Gary. Or, say the glasses store wants to stop buying real estate. So there's just really a few points to really I want to give as a, as, a, as a backbone for real estate investing. 
from all the years of experience and spending time with GPs and LPs. And, you know, now obviously have all the nightmare stories come out. It wasn't as great as they thought. And now people say this is the time to invest because the right price. Everyone has a different timing, you know. So I think number one is you have to realize when you go into real estate, it's an illiquid asset. That means you put your money in the bank, you can pull it out whenever you want. You buy a stock, you can pull it out. Real estate, you can't pull it out when you want. It's You're going to sell it when the time comes to sell. If you're desperate for the money, you're going to lose it all because you're going to sell it at a discount. So it's an illiquid asset. Mm. It's a type of deal where you're putting away for the long term, number one. It has depreciation and tax benefits. That's all fine. But just realize it's an illiquid asset. Number two is that if you're going into real estate, before you look at the numbers of any deal, the first thing you want to do is look at the person. You want to go follow someone that you trust, that's honest, that you believe has your, you know, obviously they have an ulterior motive to a certain extent because that's how they make money, but it's usually aligned. And you want to try to go with someone that their motive is to, is if they're successful, you're successful and vice versa, but mm -hmm. someone you trust mm -hmm. because a bad deal with a trustworthy person is better than the other way around. Yeah. So those with those two intros, I would also tell you, you should never, like this is as an Orthodox Jew being brought up in you know, the Talmud states, put a third, a third, a third into different things. One of the third is into real estate. So I would say put up to a third into real estate and using that as a cap. As far as a minimum, there's no minimum number. It's about the people you're investing with. If you're buying homes and you're, you decide to get involved in real estate by flipping homes that you could buy somewhere, I don't know if it exists anywhere at these prices, but a $20,000 home, okay, then 20000 is the whole price. If, you, if you're getting a mortgage for... 50% and you're buying it for 10,000 you're putting down. You have closing costs. And you have, so I think that there's no, the, it's the, what size of the building that you're buying, number one. Number two, it's the person, the GP. So in real estate investing is two people, basically. There's the GP, the general partner. That person calls all the shots. And then there's the group, the LPs, all the limited partners, the investors that invest in. The GP has a minimum. Each GP could have a minimum. Mm -hmm. So this GP could say, I only take money $10,000 checks, $50,000 checks, whatever the license, forget about licensings, just the securities laws, just in simple, that's set up. That's where the certain platforms open that were like crowd, crowdfunding, right. where a crowdfunding platform opened up and said, hey, you have the ability to put in as low as $5,000 and they would invest in a bunch of different deals. My personal opinion and recommendation is the best, if you're investing, you want to really invest directly with the GP. So someone who could put you in touch with the GP, if further you are out in the, in the, in the spectrum, I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise that. If you have no other choice, those are options to take. But if everything is even, that's your preference. Because you get to know them, you build a rapport with them, you could grow with them, you could do other things with them. If you're just a check and a number somewhere, like some of the stories you can hear coming out now, they came out on both sides of the, of the equation, but the frustration is more when people like gave to a group, they gave to another group, they gave to another group. But again, if there's a great deal and you trust the end of the movie, that's what it's publicly traded REITs. People can invest in a REIT. Right. That's liquid. You could sell if you wanted to. But that's, but that's really a long-winded answer, but I think it gives a general direction across the board. Now, from your perspective, let's focus on someone who's just thinking about getting into real estate. From your perspective, the investment of time, money, effort, is it worth it for an average person? Not someone who has a lot of liquid, but someone who like who wants to start dabbling in real estate. Okay, so again, it's I'll answer it two-sided. If sure. the person wants to become a GP, that means they want to be the person who's going to buy the deal and collect other people's money. So if that's the career they're choosing for themselves, then obviously that's the career. Do your due right. diligence and go in. Right. Your first deal, you should finally find an experienced GP yeah. and co-GP. Become like a partner of them together. That person will take the main lead. You'll get a smaller piece of the pie proportionally. And then together you'll raise money on the deal and you build your account from there. If that's on the other side of the equation, like I said, if you have that eyeglass store you mentioned, I think for sure you should go in it. Go, in, go into real estate right. because take up to a certain percent with the right person and invest. You know, they did also like people say, is there a better asset class? Should I invest in these types of deals or those types of deals? Should I do construction, development, land? A lot of this has to do with your own risk tolerance and more around the, you, you just like certain things pulls at you. Like I, I tell people all the, all the time, if you, if I, I was talking to a group of 30 people right now on the show here, all the listeners, right. and I would say, and none of them are in real estate. I take a group down in real estate and I say, you found out that your great uncle left you in a will $10 million and you can't spend it. You have to buy a piece of real estate and live off the return. What would you buy? Some people buy 10 $1 million buildings. Some people buy one $10 million building. Some people buy houses to keep flipping and sell to profit. There's no right or wrong answer. That's why real estate's different strokes, different folks. But the fundamentals, the starting point are the same. Find something you trust, make sure you do your due diligence, and you know keep taking the steps from there. Okay, Ira, th this question really applies to anyone embarking into, uh, jumping into any, any type of business. What are some of the potential benefits and the challenges 
for as it relates to jumping into real estate? And it's a pretty it's open-ended the question. Yeah, the benefits are the easiest benefits. If it goes well, you buy a building, that area, supply and demand. That's like, you know, think about when industrial, all of a sudden Amazon's opening warehouses. You could have bought something for $20 million, trudging along, I think it's worth 21 and 22 And all of a sudden, Amazon wants to be that neighborhood. And it goes through the roof. It's worth more than your business inside. Sell it for $40, 50000000 million. So <laughs> you can have that kind of upside like crazy. There's tax benefits. All the great things exist on the good. The bad is that you lose a tenant, can't afford the payments, the bank wants to foreclose on you. So there's a lot of these risks that get involved, so that's not your business. So that's why if you're going with a, if a, a syndicator or a GP that you trust, a general partner that you trust, and they have a good track record, they know the cycles. They know that never take more than this amount of leverage, or even though I could, I could have um, maybe have borrowed a little bit more, or I maybe could have... Um, taking a loan with a and have more of a return, but this it's not as long, it's not fixed for the same period of time. You know, maybe I should take it. You know, a couple of years ago, people were taking floating rate deals because they said real estate's only getting better and better. Why lock in? Now those people in hindsight don't look great. Today, some people say the opposite. Don't take a long term rate today. Rates are up. Right. Take a floating rate today because at least you get the benefits going to keep going down. Right. The other people say no, it's going to keep going up. It's safe. You, you can't time these things. You can't. You know. You know, I, 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 tell, I tell a client, what business are you in? The stock business? Buy stocks. If you're in real estate, the loan makes sense today. Take the loan that gives you the safest thing to go do the loan. But other people have different opinions. So if you're going in the ups and downs, it's a risk with anything else. But it has one huge difference than anything else is that it's illiquid. The right. pro, though, to a certain extent, if you're a big enough investor in the deal, you have a say in what we should do different for the building. Should we upgrade? Is it worth taking that risk? You invest in Microsoft. You invest in Apple. You invest in Google. You have no say. Right. You know, so that's that's like some people like the fact they have a say. Some people like the fact that there's actual tangible asset. At the end of the day, is a, right. there's a building here. Right. And if I can figure out how to juggle the payments for the next 30 years, one day I don't have a mortgage in theory. There's another game to always borrow as much as you can. You'll see all different strokes of different folks about how they do business based on how their mentor told them how they should buy real estate. We're speaking with Iris Lotto. It's Tonight Show, Streamlining CRE Transactions. Benefits and risks of investing in real estate and the strategies to getting into the real estate world. To find out more information, gparency.com. It's that simple. What about the app? Maybe you talk about some of the uh, tools you have for smartphones. Right. So, right now, we were interesting. Um, you, me you mentioned that that when we started building out the technology, we found that when it comes to all the apps are popular all around. But when it comes to doing research on real estate, on commercial real estate, mm -hmm. it's not like Zillow. You see a house. You actually want to see the neighborhood, what's going on in the building next door. You want to see some documents, you want to upload documents. People do overwhelming majority, they do this from the desktop. So we're really based on, uh, it's, it's, it's not optimized that great, the whole mapping system for the phone. We're getting better, but it's meant for the desktop. Because you know, so, at the end of the day, that's really, the person probably has multiple screens open and they're checking different types of information as opposed to- We're hoping to, that they don't have to check multiple streams. Like the, the uh -huh. beauty of our system is, the way I explain it to somebody is that people like to have reference points. Oh, you're like blank, like, you know? So I tell people, imagine if you had Zillow or Google Maps. We are licensed Google Maps. So if Google Maps overlaid with public data, so I look at a property in Google Maps, say, I wonder who, when the mortgage was taken. Oh, right there. You don't have to go to another site. Because I bring the, uh, I wonder if something in the neighborhood closed recently. Oh, these are the buildings with comps in the area, basic comps. Is anything for sale in the neighborhood? Other things? Oh, these buildings have we have a hundred thousand properties where we link who the broker is, so you could call the broker. What's going on? So you have one, the Google Street View, all the all the Google functionality overlaid on a map with real estate on top of it. That's the public information. Then you have you can have your private information. Which deals on in the United States do I own? So imagine every time you open up a property, it puts a star in it. It gets added to your pipeline. So, you know, I once saw that building in Brooklyn. What was that address? I once saw the deal in Texas. What was that address? Zoom out of Texas. You'll see where the dot is and zoom down. You see that property. So, also, I saw this building two years ago. Who's the broker? Put notes in. You could put documents in. So, we a calculator could underwrite a deal in minutes. You could send an alert if anything goes for sale, closes, or refinance in that neighborhood. So, all these tools, it basically takes your world overlaid on top of a map. So, it's a, it's a marketplace because on they have a list of lenders. I have the rates. We actually did ChatGPT is all the rage. So we have, instead of you having to go to the, the, the top few real estate sites, it goes to the top few real estate sites. Summarize the news. So right there, while you're on this map marketplace, whatever you could need is there for you at that time. And that's you keep your notes. Because interesting, you speak to the typical person in real estate and you know from the LP to the GP, say, what buildings do you own? 
I have Excel spreadsheet at the top of my head. They, there's no system. People have a great systems. All the billion trillion dollar systems start from the second step. They start once you already know you want to buy this building, then the software to do A, the software to do B, to raise it. But where do you holistically put it all together? Where do you compare notes? Where's the CRM for commercial real estate? Where's that one centralized place? And that's your platform. That's, that's the platform. GParency.com. My guest, Ira Zlotowicz, founder and CEO of GParency. Ira, as mentioned before, you're quite transparent. A quick question, if I may, just you know, uh, oh, I, during the commercial break, came to mind. Earlier, you were discussing a tip that you got from dad, and that is about creating a product. And one of the ways of being mindful about competition is put it out at a price point that will uh, that will 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 get tremendous buy-in from the masses but it will be competitive enough that a competitor will say ah, I can't do it for that price could you elaborate on that yeah so it really goes with the first piece of that that okay. I said the first piece of advice was build the best product you possibly could build okay yeah right left that part out. then with that that really applies to anything and then with that what is the cheapest that you could sell it for? Not to be a cheap mm -hmm. product. So right. if, if if I was building, like I I'm, I built a brokerage team over all the years. Mm -hmm. I took with me my best broker that worked on my own personal deals. And I just ran the math that if I was able to get, if you look at the life of a mortgage broker, a mortgage broker, a team could close 100 deals a year. So when we, when, when we, would, we have a product that for about $11,000 or so, We'll do everything from A to Z as a broker. The whole, everything. Okay, over time, people just want to place the deal, but let's go with the 11,000. Mm -hmm. Because how do you do it for so cheap? I said, most brokers, how much do you think they make? The people that do actual work, right? They make a half a million dollars. They have an underwriter that works for them, two, 300,000. They have an analyst under them for 100,000. They close 100 deals a year. 11,000 times 100 is a million one. It's profitable. Oh, I never realized it that way. Because the universe is charging who took the money, the brokerage shop or the broker, took the money while the people did the work. So I built the best broker, best brokerage team with all the tools and you could access that tool, just pay the 11,000. So that someone tomorrow morning, could they come for 10,900? I don't know how they're going to do it, but if they did do it, that's not blowing away the competition. Right. Think about when I went into business. Will you open up a business? Anyone on this, any of the audience, they want to open a business. What's the first thing they say? Barrier to entry, who is there right. now? Right. So if there was another company that was charging $20,000 to do a deal and they felt they could do it for 10 or they were charging for a marketplace giving all these tools for $5,000 10000 they could do it for 5000 okay that's your I think I could do it for cheaper I could do it better for cheaper those are the only two things you could do to improve I built the product that ba there's nothing I know that I could make it better and there's nothing I know that I could do it at a cheaper price so if I'm already the incumbent what's the odds now will someone come in from a different door or have a reason to lose money on this as a lead gen for the business, which I, I don't know, maybe that could possibly happen. Similarly, I'm sure that your competitors, I'm in this space, that are realizing, hey, they were selling one slug of a tool or one slug of a piece of data that I'm incorporating for free and why is someone buying their software? Or there was no play in town for a certain thing, so they're able to charge a premium. But now the client says, hey, I go to GParency for this, why should I come to you for that? So obviously there's an element that I'm doing to other people happens in business. But I'm not giving someone that's thought out with a business plan to say, let me open this. Also, the cost, you know, when it comes to real estate, that's just a good example in the real estate, you know, conversation, there's always that big debate, what's called a good deal? Um, is it the right return? So some people have a metric called replacement cost. I bought this building for $10 million. If it burnt down, It'll cost 12 million to build. I'm buying it below replacement cost, meaning it can't it can't go down. Like that type of mindset. Obviously, like the Titanic syndrome. When you say it can't go, that's when it goes. So we spent the last two years building the technology. And we built it knowing after 20 years of living in this space. And I was dreaming about this for 20 years and knowing what to build and how to build it. Even if someone said they could build it tomorrow, I don't think they could build it for cheaper than we built it. Right. to get the same brand. But again, is there someone out there that could use me as a lead gen and the whole tool goes, like when Google gave away different features. So that's a risk, but I can't plan for that. Right. You know, like, you know, they, they, they talk about when, when, when you could plan for a lot of things, if someone's willing to commit suicide, blow themselves up, and they talk about in, in, in the war, you can't plan for that. You can plan for a normal case, in the normal case. So can I get competition? Will I have competition? Yes. Certain people will be like blockbusters. They waited too long, they won't be able to compete. But my bigger fear is 
I'm not worried about the big shops. What I'm worried about is starting to happen now. There's a guy working in a shop, and he leaves the shop. When he realized he was making only a small percent of the commission on a deal. He's only looking to recoup his lousy $200,000. So he could walk into an owner and says, I close your deals. I'll do all your deals a year for $25,000. He gets 10 clients, he makes his living, and he goes home. Okay, I lose those 10. But is that a scalable business? No, maybe, yeah, maybe not. Mm. But I'm really a step before that. My goal, people, I'm not looking to be in the mortgage business. My goal is not to sell the $4,500 placement. I'm looking just for the $500,000 $5, a year, build up to that. That's it. If there's 10 million people paying $5,000 a year or a million people that's or 100000 that's, that's my exit. Mind. So people came to invest in the business and the shareholders came in is because, and I truly believe that we have the potential for 100 times exit because th there could be competition. I want 10% market share. There's 90% I'm leaving. So even if you came in, and it's good for this, it's different, different approaches, but I'm finding as time is going in and out, I'm the first door. So that's the long-winded answer. But that's what comes no, together. Thank you. Uh, let's talk about LPs, limited partners. You know, just even before I get into specific questions, perhaps you can just talk about that arena and especially how g Parency opens up a whole world to that arena. So when g Parency opened... Um, G Parency is primarily focused, as the name, G Parency, GP Transparency, all the tools that a GP can need. And when we opened up, we said, maybe some basic tools that an LP could benefit also, because they need the same things, calculator, rates, they want to check things out sometimes. Sometimes an LP is a GP, right? So he built certain features, because one of the perks also is, let's do this on, the, on a superficial level. LPs want to invest in deals, they don't have access to deals. Right. GPs want the LPs. Right. So if I have a platform, I can connect the two together. But I, I will tell the audience something that most people don't realize and know, is that when investing in real estate and raising equity, that's a security. It's like selling a stock. So there's a lot of laws that, that govern it. If you notice, you don't really see too many companies going out there, I'm raising money, do you want to invest with me? That's called a public solicitation. There's laws against it. There's laws if you do it, what, you have to, what has to take place. It's very costly. Not what you do, how you do. So many GPs can really only go to friends and family and accredited investors. There's a lot of laws that govern it from the GP perspective. Because we're a marketplace, it's an advertising platform. So a, you can't have a success fee. And G Parents' whole business model is we don't take success fees. So we take, you want to engage me, I'll do your deal for the 4,500, you pay up front. How do you know if it's going to produce or not? You hire an attorney, you hire other vendors, if you want to go ahead and take the risk, I'll take the risk. Pay me triple, pay me double, pay me 10 times, I'll take the risk. But I'm willing to tell you, just pay the money up front and it's good. Right? And so far, we got great reviews, great feedback. The business is the business. There's no like fluff from there. But on the, on the LP side, same thing. Now, because I'm not in the brokerage, if I want, I used to broker equity. You have to be licensed security. My, the, the previous firm had a, had a division. They would broker equity, they charge a big fee because you have to find an LP, convince them you have a reputation risk. For G Parents, when you open, the plan was, let me potentially help raising of equity. And the way we were going to help potentially raise equity is that if the LPs on the platform, we'll make introductions. Obviously, this market is a little thing, so we backburned that idea. What happened now is that as the real estate market went where it went, we're getting so many calls from LPs that, and really it's GPs also. What's happening is a lot of deals went sour. No fault to the GP. They ran the business great. There are bad apples everywhere. But the brand and people started to attack the general GP the bad. Why did they take a floating rate? Why did they buy this deal? And it's very good being a Monday morning quarterback and yeah. knocking them from there. So are there bad apples? Yes. Do I believe the overwhelming did the right thing and tried to do the right thing and are good people? Without a doubt. So a lot of them are calling and saying, you know, G parency is transparency. And like, is there any tools like, you know, I realize LPs have a need. My LPs have a need. They don't even know what the deals are holding, tracking. Could you help out? I'm getting calls like that. So we actually... Um, rolled out a feature. This is literally as we speak. Few days the beta, ago. Yeah. Few, the beta a few days ago. The official launch is tomorrow, you know, where on every single property card, which we discussed before, we added a button called LP. And the LP, could, instead of their Excel spreadsheet or nothing, the LP can have a ledger how much they put into the deal every time they received money when they received money. They could then say, what are they supposed to get? on their next check, what's the frequency, monthly, quarterly, yearly, and then how much, and then set an alert. And the alert will be in the event that you don't update the ledger when you say you're supposed to, or you update it 
but lower than you said you're supposed to get, it'll send you an alert. So at least you're in the know. And on top of that, it will give you live what your cash on cash return is. Like I said before, cash on cash and IRR. And you call up the GP and say, if I sold today, what would my lump, lump, lump check be? Mm-hmm. Put it in, it'll calculate live what your IRR would be. So in these scenarios now, we gave a tool for an LP to be in the know. No LP has it. So when we're building this, like, you know, I, I, I tell people all the time, one of my clients told me that, and I was speaking to him about the business I choose, he goes, I the goal in life is to help people and make money. Some people are fortunate enough that they can do both at the same time. You could, on the other hand, work in a soup kitchen. You're helping a lot of people. You're not making a living. Other times, you could do the, the nastiest job, make a lot of money, and you'll have to only be able to help people by using that money to do good. Right. So if you can be in both bets. And I was thinking to myself, like, you know, here's the situation where there's an LP who's in pain, has no way to keep track. It doesn't make sense to spend big money. There's no system out there that's, that's LP-centric. There's no system that has the interest of the LP of a system. There's a lot of systems out there, great systems, that are for the GP could buy and say, hey, these are my investors. Let them log into the platform. That's great for the GP view, and the LP helps. But let's say the LP just wants, I don't invest with someone who has a system, or I, I just want my own dashboard for myself. Like my own. There's no system built for them. So I said, hey, here's a win-win. I could add this feature. Some of the GPs requested it. And at the same time, my system works because being free. So you could use the way like a price system up to 25 deals at any time. Most don't have 25 deals. And if they do, it's $100 a month. They're paying. It's not real money that, that's making a difference. But at the same time, if that LP is on there and they start using the other tools they also have, there's a calculator. They can say, wow, there's a, they share it to people. Hey, where did you get this from? Oh, your parents say. So this this can go ahead and pay, pay Marketing back. Marketing value. Marketing value. It's more like it's like the viral value. It's like, the, you know, I read a book years ago called The Go-Giver. I would love to say, what can I keep building quality and quality and giving and giving and giving? And hopefully that comes back. And so th- this thing worked out. The GPs are so happy with this, this move. LPs love it. They have something in front of them. There's documents. They could store the documents. They could store the notes. They, they could put an alert on the neighborhood. An LP doesn't know anything. They bought a building in Texas. Right. They don't know anything about Texas. Press the button on the property. If anything trades hands in the neighborhood, comes to sale, they know it. They're not like they're, they're in the know. When they get a new deal. They could use the calculator. You know real estate? I did a real estate course, load it onto the site again, same free value. You could go through the real estate course when you're doing using the calculator, even if you're a novice, even if you're acquisition Alice, you could go through that real estate course and uh, go through the calculator just mm-hmm. by the numbers the client sent you and you could start realizing what questions to ask. I tell ChatGPT, one of the biggest things at the beginning of ChatGPT was you say, write a contract that I'm buying a building and also draft this contract. People were wowed, you know, the first iteration right, of it. That, yeah. But you know what the interesting is? In that contract, it left blank spaces like Mad Libs. So you knew what you're supposed to ask. Like, and I'll get, uh, my deposit will be, I didn't tell you the deposit. It knew you have to have a deposit. Like you can ask, what am I missing? So when someone says, tells you, invest in deal, get a 25% return. You call your friend, I invest. Uh, what cap are you buying at? What? Oh, you now could take his book, OM, and put it into the calculator and all this saves at the same time. So it's the same tool. So the same one tool gets everyone in real estate. And my goal is to get that, the, the of the GPs, the heavy hitter GPs, Use it all the time and move through the funnel. All right, Ira, we still uh, still have around seven, eight minutes left to the show. Um, before we get back to the LP investment tracker, because I still want to get some more. It, it sounds sounds too good to be true, and that's really what it. Uh, and it sounds like that's exactly what it is. But I would like to get and some leaving more no detail. room for competition. I, yeah, <laughs> you, know? you discussed that as well. But how does the you know the rates? Are like when you first got into the industry around twenty five years ago. The rates are quite high. How does that factor in for an LP? I'm sure you get the question all the time. Like, is now the right time to get involved in real estate with the rates so high, or maybe it's a terrible time? Okay, so I'm going to answer now the question for the LP. Okay. It's different from the GP. So the LP, what changed is as follows. Three years ago, four years ago, banks were paying 0%. LPs that make money in their, in their store, in their business. They're thinking about retirement, where they put in their money. They'll, if they found the real estate deal... Even if it's throwing about five percent, eight percent, nine percent, it's some money. Yeah. Preferred returns, whatever the terminologies are. Yeah. What's happening now is that an LP could put money in the bank, liquid, pull it out when they want, safe, four percent, five percent, six percent, three and a half percent, all different numbers in that range. Mm-hmm. They say, you know something? Unless I'm getting a deal that could sh- could price out. The reason why real estate prices are nervous going down is is driven by the LPs. Part of it. They're not a fault. They're not doing bad. Mm-hmm. But they say, I'm not going to invest in a deal where you're only going to pay me 7% and my money's a liquid and then only have to wait for it upside down the line. 
If I can money the bank at 5.6, I'd rather secure a 5.6 because I don't know what's going to happen in real estate. So they're demanding more. In order for them to demand more, that means that GP has to be able to have more profit to pay. Right. They can't pay the same price for the building. Right? One of the coolest features when we rolled out this calculator, you know, and we show it to someone that says, you got to do one ad, very important feature. I know the return I need to make. I finished underwriting the whole deal a couple of minutes in. It showed me an IRR 25.3. I know that my investors need a 30%. Just any number, just make up the number. We just, we're adding that with the calculator coming out, dropping next week. We can type in, I need 30%. It will go back and re-engineer and calculate. If that's the case, this is what you got to pay. So because that, the seller says, I'm not selling anymore. So it's, a lot, it, it's feeding a lot less transactions. What got us to this point? What got us to this point was that real estate was this opaque business. Who wants to go and deal with tenants? Also, it's a big issue politically in certain states, right? Yeah. They want, the government does, I mean, not the government, they don't want landlords to make money. And then is, they don't understand the whole dynamic of everything. But so that's a level of risk. Then you have, um, um, so over in the beginning, real estate kept going up. Bought a building for 10 million, sold it for 12 million, right. sold it for 14 million, cashed out, refinanced, bought it. Everyone, everyone wants to get involved. So someone said, I don't want to take, you know, a GP went over to someone and said, um, do you want to invest in real estate? And the guy would say yes and raise the money. Then you have LPs approach GPs. That the the big GPs who have to collect money. Right. LPs say, "Can I invest with you? Why should I take your money for?" Because I'm willing to make less than the other guy. Okay, he might pay nine percent. You only take eight. <laughs> so they're competing against other LPs. Because of that, this GP said, "I have cheaper money." Plus rates dropped. Plus rents went up. So whatever got us here, something an interesting point. Real estate went from being being about um, bricks and mortar, right? The real right, estate yep. to financial engineering. So now that real estate prices went up, now that, now that rates are up, inflation's up, everything that got us here is exactly the opposite. It's nerve-wracking to invest in real estate sometimes. People get scared. It's it's illiquid. I don't know if I'm cashing on two years from now. Last deal is two years later, flip a house, you get it back. I don't know if I'm getting it back that fast. You want me to lock it for long term? I got to make a much higher premium. Now the seller says, whoa, 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 whoa. I was selling this property at $10 million. You want to offer me nine? I'm not selling. What do I do with the money? In the last market, the guys, I'm not selling for 10. Okay, I'll pay you 11. Now it's just the opposite. So for an LP sometimes, you know, where a few clients put the perspective, and I agree with it, is that a deal today is probably, if you go into it today, is probably a safer deal if you actually go into it. Because by the time you're ready, the rates are up. Right. So there's room to right. go down, more room to go right. down than up. Right. You you calculated the rents are not growing. And if it makes sense today, it should make sense over time. As opposed to a few years ago, deal works. What if, eh, rates are going to keep, never going to go up. Eh. Rents are never going to go down. Now it's the opposite, which makes it a positive. But for an LP, there's a level of you want to make sure that the people you're investing with today are definitely honest. Are they are they doing a deal to save themselves for another deal, or are they doing the right deal? So ask these questions. Be transparent. All right. Before I get to my last question, just a uh, just to close out on the LP investment tracker. Again, you just launched it. It's also on the, uh, the gparents.com. You go to gparents.com. You log into the marketplace, and you're in. And it's an app. You have it as an app. You know, it's not an app. It's it's it's, it's mobile. Regular. It works mobile. Go go to the go to the screen. Yeah. Right. I saw it, but it's mobile friendly. It's all all set up. I, I want to take a something that to uh, to go to an office. People are coming to the business, so I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Um, I respond to all the messages on LinkedIn. I definitely see them. People just want to go to other platforms because if I went to a bunch of other platforms, I couldn't be responding to the messaging mm -hmm. there. But I will say to the audience, if someone has a real estate question, I will give out my cell number. And you could <laughs> WhatsApp me. I prefer WhatsApp or text. I definitely see it. I try to respond. Um, it's 917-597-2197. I have one number. I don't have four different numbers of different groups and different people. <laughs> and to email me, is irz at gparency.com. If it's a quicker question, probably as an email, because then I could forward it to the right person on my team to be able to go and help you. And this is what my goal is. My goal is to, you know, if I, as much as I could give back, I'd rather, like I said, if I can make money and help people at the same time, why do I have to go do two different businesses? Let's do it all together at the same time. So gparency.com, it's built for that. Like, and it's 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 mobile. It's mo it works on mobile. Not that great compared to the desktop. We're gonna get that better, but that's where we're at. Before we close out the show, you you also have your uh, your finger on the pulse, and you uh, you know you're known to kind of look into the future. What are some tips, just as we close in the last minute or two, that you could share with the audience? Uh, that kind of a, a, a trend that you see coming up ahead. Uh, we all know that those that follow you on uh, LinkedIn, you you call the ChatGPT and the AI revolution early on. Embrace it. 
learn it. Don't let it, you know, don't let it pass you by. What are some other tips you could share with, for whatever industry you're in? I think that um, the most important thing I think the trend is going to, we're going more to a world of gig economy. And I says years ago with like with Uber, that's the best example. You know, I have a car. I, I met this guy. I, I took an Uber, really a professional guy. I said, you're an Uber driver? Like, I didn't fit in the beginning, the stereotype. He goes, I work in downtown. He's take the train. I wanted to have a car. So I, I saw him as Uber. I leave my house extra 50 minutes earlier. I put the destination in my office building. I drive to work along the way. I, I, I rides. And when I leave, I can leave that second. I have to wait on a train. And I go back home. And I make money. And it covers the cost of the gas and the tolls. And I, and, and I have a car. So... <laughs> the the world we live in is a world of like my whole company is remote and I hire experts in each space. So I don't hire a marketing guy or marketing gal. I hire what's your expertise? We need someone for SEO, I'm hiring SEO. I need someone for CRO uh, conversion rate optimization. I need someone to do different I hire each niche of each person, but if they don't use ChatGPT, I don't use them. If they're not using AI, I'm not using them. I want someone ahead of the curve. So I just think that I think it's gonna happen going forward is that a lot of companies, especially if you're using remote, I'm going to say, what's the difference if this person's working for me part-time, full-time? What's the difference where the world is sitting? And I think that equilibrium is going to start coming out there. People can say, I'm going to hire for a niche. So if you have a great niche of what you do, then you're going to be able to charge hourly for that at a higher rate. You'll have more clients and customers. So that's coming more and more fractured. Like, do I need a CFO caliber or would I take fractured CFO? Do I need a CMO? Fractured CMO. What am I missing? Take the pieces you're missing. And, you know, so I have in my office great coordinators executionists they could execute and follow through but then then it works great if you have a high level cmo because you put the glue together and when you have these so i think that's where the trend is going to so staying ahead of the curve but know that's where it's going to go if you have a job those are opportunities for you and your boss is probably looking to see what's the best of you they'd rather have you only for the expertise you bring to the table I think that's where the trend is the next thing going to come to the economy. What an incredible show. Iris Lodowitz, thank you so much for joining me here on the set on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. This wraps up a great edition of Mind Your Business. Tune in again next Sunday night for another great edition of Mind Your Business right here on 710 WOR. Have a successful week. Thank you for watching and make sure to subscribe to this channel and be notified every single time a new video goes live. Don't miss out on any of the weekly interviews that I have with top business leaders, sometimes Fortune 500 executives. Hit subscribe and turn on notifications.